Good evening and welcome to the 2018 Joseph and Rebecca Meyerhoff Annual Lecture. The Meyerhoff Lecture is made possible through the generosity of the Meyerhoff family and is organized by the museum's Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies. My name is Leah Wolfson and I am the Senior Program Officer at the Mandel Center. Printed materials about the museum's many programs and initiatives, including those of the Mandel Center, are available on the tables just outside the theater. Before we begin, I'd like to recognize Harvey M. Meyerhoff, who was one of the founders of this museum and Chairman Emeritus of the United States Holocaust Memorial Council, and who, with his sister, Eleanor Katz, endowed this lecture in 1994 in tribute to their parents' tradition of philanthropic support for Jewish learning and scholarship. The Meyerhoff Lecture honors excellence in research on the Holocaust and fosters dissemination of cutting edge Holocaust scholarship. Mr. Meyerhoff is unfortunately unable to be with us tonight. Please join me in acknowledging his generous contribution to this museum and this lecture. <clears throat> Our distinguished speaker tonight is Dr. Todd Presner. Professor Presner is chair of the University of California at Los Angeles Digital Humanities Program and Ross Professor of Germanic Languages and Comparative Literature. Since 2018, he is Associate Dean of Digital Innovation in the Division of Humanities and advisor to the Vice Chancellor of Research for Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences Research. From 2011 to 2018, he was the Sadie and Ludwig Kahn Director of the UCLA Center for Jewish Studies. Professor Presner's research focuses on European intellectual history, the history of media, visual culture, digital humanities, and cultural geography. He is the author or co-author of five books, including Mobile Modernity, Germans, Jews, Trains, Muscular Judaism, The Jewish Body and the Politics, of Regeneration, Digital Humanities, which he co-authored with Anne Burdick, Joanna Drucker, Peter Lunefeld, and Jeffrey Schnapp, and Probing the Ethics of Holocaust Culture, co-edited with Claudio Fogu and Wolf Kotsteiner. Professor Presner also serves as the faculty co-PI on the Urban Humanities Initiative at UCLA. From 2005 to 2015, Dr. Presner was director of HyperCities, a collaborative digital mapping platform that explores the layered history of city spaces. Awarded one of the first digital media and learning prizes by the MacArthur Foundation Haystack in 2008, HyperCities Hyper is an interactive web-based research and teaching environment for authoring and analyzing the cultural, architectural, and urban history of cities. Finally, Professor Presner is project director of Mapping Jewish Los Angeles which is a digital anthology of 12 interactive exhibitions focused on the history of Jewish LA told through archival collections, mapping, and data visualization. Professor Presner's lecture tonight is entitled From Wire Recorder to Database, Testimony, Technology, Technologies, and the Digitization of the Holocaust. When sociologist David Boder first began his interviews with Holocaust survivors in displaced persons camps in the summer of 1946, he had no way of knowing that his scratchy wire recordings would summon, as some scholars have now termed it, an era of testimony. Describing his effort in the, his 1949 book, I Did Not Interview the Dead, Boder recalled, the wonder of hearing their voices recorded was boundless. When the selected individuals appeared for the interview, I would say, we know very little in America about the things that happened to you in concentration camps. If you want to help us out by contributing information about the fate of the displaced persons, tell your own story. Today, this mandate to tell your own story is a given, resulting in hundreds of thousands of hours of recorded testimony in a variety of forms. The museum's own collection alone contains over 20,000 hours of material available to the public. What began with large unwieldy spools of tape is now preserved and available digitally, opening up a universe of possibilities and questions. We look forward to hearing Dr. Presner's insights on the past, the present, and the future uses of this invaluable and at times overwhelming trove of voices and stories. I now ask that you silence all noise-making devices, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Todd Presner to the podium. <laughs> 
So I'm <clears throat> going to speak from, uh, with a lapel mic, and hopefully you can hear me just fine. Prepare a couple of things. Thank you, Leah. Uh, thank you so much for that generous introduction. And I want to begin by extending a number of thanks. Um, let's see, we'll switch the slide over. Um, first to Robert Ehrenreich, uh, Kira Kago Schneider, Leah Wolfson, members of the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Research. I'm especially grateful to the Meyerhoff family for endowing this lecture. It's truly an honor to be here and have the opportunity to present my research in Holocaust studies, and thank you all for coming out tonight. Many people have helped me, so support me over the years, and much of the research I'll present tonight is collaborative in nature. Before I begin, I do want to thank the UCLA Library Special Collections and the David Boder Archive, USC's Shoah Foundation Visual History Archive and its executive director, Stephen Smith, Sam Gustafson, Crispin Brooks, and Martha Stroud for their generosity sharing the full database of the archive and giving me access to their collections. Wolf Gruner, uh, the director of USC's Shoah Foundation Center for Advanced Genocide Research, the US Holocaust Memorial Museum and the Mandel Center, and members of my research team, including Rachel Deblinger, David Shepard, Campbell Yamane, Zoe Borofsky. Finally, I wanna say a word of gratitude to Alan Rosen, a historian, who authored the book, The Wonder of Their Voices, which is to date the most authoritative book on the 1946 interviews by David Boder. My work owes a debt of gratitude for his historical research and analysis. Last but not least, um, sitting in the front row are members of my family, my mom and dad, my partner Jaime and son Mateo. I'm very honored, happy that you're here tonight and thank you all for your patience and support over the years. Tonight's lecture doesn't start in our contemporary digital world, but rather in the late 1940s and early 1950s, because it's here that I locate a critical approach to documenting and analyzing the Holocaust through media technologies and scientific methods informed by ethical concerns. It's the beginning of what I'll later call the ethics of the algorithm, an approach to computation and technology that's guided in and emerges from ethical concerns. Tonight's lecture starts with a man named David Boder. As we already heard from Leah, he has a unique place in the history of Holocaust testimony collection because he was the first person to record the voices of survivors in their own words in displaced person camps in 1946. He conducted more than 100 interviews with survivors in nine different languages, he actually spoke nine, using a relatively new technology called a wire recorder, which is pictured here. Today, most of the interviews are available online through the Illinois Institute of Technology Voices of the Holocaust website, and I encourage you to have a look if you'd like. While we did not, he did not call these testimonies in the sense in which we use the word now, they were the first audio narratives told in the words of the survivors themselves of their experiences during the Holocaust. These narratives are not new or unknown. In fact, Boder published a book already referenced in 1949 called I Did Not Interview the Dead, which contained portions of eight of the interviews. He worked indefatigably to interest a broad lay public in learning about the experiences of the survivors. He appeared on radio programs. He took part in public debates over DPs and emigration in the 1950s. He worked with Jewish relief organizations and sent copies of his interviews on microcard and microfiche to libraries across the Anglophone world. Almost 40 years after Boder died, oops, Donald Lewick, working with the Research Institute of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, published a collection of 34 of these early narratives of survival. And as I mentioned earlier, Alan Rosen published a study of Boder's work called The Wonder of Their Voices, which, as Leah mentioned, captures the survivor's own boundless wonder of hearing their voices recorded. My contribution to the study of Boder actually places his work in a somewhat different research framework. And you get a clue about that with the diagrams and pictures that you see at the bottom there. I'm gonna focus almost exclusively on his analytical work, which is really proto-computational. And this analytical work was indexing, encoding, comparing, interpreting the testimonies using a mixture of quantitative social science methods and qualitative experimental readings. Boder was trained as a psychologist and he straddled many different worlds between languages, the new and the old world, the pre and the post-Holocaust eras, and between the social sciences and the humanities, 
between a commitment to quantitative analysis and qualitative interpretation. I consider David Boder a kind of proto-digital humanist, not because he actually used digital tools, although I think he probably would have if he had them available, but because he used technology to bring together humanistic, historical, documentary, and ethical concerns with large-scale computational analysis. So before we begin, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about David Boder. Oops, go back here. He was born in 1886 in Lubau, Russia, present-day Latvia. He grew up speaking Yiddish, German, Russian. He was an Eastern European Jew, had a mix of traditional and secular education. He attended a Jewish teacher's institute in Vilna before going to the University of Leipzig to study experimental psychology, then the Psycho Psychoneurological Institute in St. Petersburg. He immigrated to the United States in 1926 and became a citizen in 32. He completed a master's at the University of Chicago in the field of psycholinguistics and his doctorate at Northwestern in physiological psychology. He began teaching at the Lewis Institute in 1927. It became the Illinois Institute of Technology shortly after that in 1940 and was chair of both the psychology and the philosophy departments. In 1952, he moved to UCLA's psychology department and he died in 61 at the age of 75. Boder conceived of his interviewing project around May of 1945, and I'll periodically give you some uh, snippets of material that he wrote from the UCA archive. Um, UCLA happens to have um, much of, many of the papers from David Boder, and the rest are at the, in Akron at the University of Ohio. Boder conceived of his interviewing project in May of 1945 and spent much of the next 14 months gathering financial support and clearances to travel to post-war Europe and conduct research in DP camps. He originally imagined the project as a broader ethnography, including interviews with victims, perpetrators, bystanders, and war sufferers of all kinds, but he knew from the beginning that he wanted to use the wire recorder. And as he wrote in 1945, the reason is that the wire recorder captures sound, speech, and music with high fidelity. It's portable, the recordings are permanent, they can be duplicated, and they require no post-production processing. The technology of the wire recorder, or recording sound on wire was actually invented at the end of the 19th century. And wire recorders, though, were not practically and commercially available until several decades later. The basic principle involves pulling a thin steel wire, and you can actually see how thin it is there. It's about twice the diameter of a human hair, across a recording head which magnetizes each point along the wire according to the intensity and the polarity of the audio signal. The wire is about 7,000 feet long itself, and as you can see, it's about 0.004 inches in diameter. They're fragile, and they often would break. And this caused a problem when he was recording. The portable wire recorder brought by Boder to Europe was invented and manufactured at the Illinois Institute of Technology. And just as a side note, tape recorders became commercially available a couple years later, 1948, quickly replacing wire recording because tapes obviously are not so bulky or expensive. About 14 months after the end of the war, Boder finally arrived in Europe and began interviewing displaced persons almost every day. He began in 1946 in Paris. Interviews took place in France, Switzerland, Italy, finally in Germany, and mostly with Jewish survivors of concentration camps and slave labor camps, as well as with a small group of what he called friendly European refugees, which mostly consisted of Mennonites and other Christians who fled Soviet territories. Boder worried in 1946 that he was actually too late because memory and emotions fade over time. To counter such forgetting and provide a rationale for his recordings, he began, as Leah said, with the idea of transmitting the knowledge to American audiences. We know very little in America about the things that happened to you in concentration camps. If you want to help us out by contributing information about the fate of displaced persons, he tells his interviewee, tell us your story, begin with your name, Give your age. Tell where you were when the war started and what happened to you since. All told, he recorded about 120 interviews. The number is a little contested. It may be as high as 129. And he did this over about two months. The interviews vary in length from about 20 minutes to four hours in duration. And I summarized a little bit of the, the kind of the, the numbers of what we're talking about. Nine different languages, 16 different sites, 120 hours on 190 wire spools, resulted in a transcription 
and a translation that he did himself uh, with a number of partners and students and collaborators. Um, an unpublished book called Topical Autobiographies, of which you can see in the right-hand corner, that's from the UCLA archive, and a book that he published that we referenced earlier from 1949 called I Did Not Interview the Dead. I should also mention that we've begun some preliminary linguistic analysis. Um, it's about a million words in total, and of those million words, there's 12,315 questions that he asked, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, not every question demanded an answer. Sometimes it was a prompting to get more information from the survivors. But nevertheless, we're talking about a huge and very early trove of early testimonial material. Almost as soon as he returned to the States, Boder began the work of transcribing, translating, publishing, and analyzing interviews. And this work would occupy him for the rest of his life. He endeavored earnestly to construct a historical understanding of the range of experiences told to him by the survivors. And he very much wanted to bring this knowledge to a broader public. He was interested in the truth of what happened, but also how the interviewees put their experiences into language. And I want to stress the how, because that's going to be an important part of our analysis tonight. What do the narratives reveal about the kinds of trauma they suffered? How did they put those traumas into language? And could these narratives, and this is his speculative question, could they point to a more general theory of trauma, language, and memory? These are questions that he struggled with um, in his analytic phase in the 1940s and late 40s and early 50s. Part of what Boder realized very early on was the importance of a multidisciplinary approach to studying the Holocaust, using interpretive methods from the sciences and the humanities, in his case, psychology, linguistics, and literary studies. He also realized he had a problem of scale, the number of testimonies, the hours of auditory material, the hundreds of thousands of words in nine languages, In an unpublished manuscript, which he intended to include in his book, and he didn't, he says the point-by-point -point analysis of these unique documents is a task of the future. It shall require the efforts of more than one investigator and the collaboration of experts of the most divergent scientific fields. The evaluation of the events and their emotional impact, the indexing of the different experiences, the cataloging of the psychological and cultural factors, the articulation of the forces behind the behaviors and the attitudes, all gives rise to what he calls a scientific and a lit literary adventure. It requires systematic analysis from the social sciences and literary analysis attuned to the verbalization of what he calls these kaleidoscopic events. In this early unpublished manuscript, analyzing the testimony of Anna Kovitska, she was one of the final interviews that he did, Boder develops an experimental mode of reading and analysis that points towards some of his more systematic studies that he'd undertaken in the years to come. Kowitska was a 34-year-old Polish Jew who was sent to Auschwitz, lost most of her family, including her young baby, which she had given, who she had given to a Gentile Polish woman in the hopes that the baby would survive. It turned out the Polish woman was denounced and the baby was killed. In his analysis of the interview, Boder provides an overview of what he understands about the Holocaust. And remember, we're talking about 1946, 47, 48. He attempts to embed her individual story in this much broader pan-European event. He takes quotations from her narrative and interprets them closely as well as at a distance, focusing on key words such as mother in the narrative before zooming out, as it were, to understand the breakdown of the familial unit and social culture social and cultural impact of the traumas. He toggles the view, so to speak, between the individual case and an attempt to generalize broader experiences. As he does this, Boder pays particular attention to what is omitted from the narratives. He says, her inability to find the proper words for the adequate description of non-conventional grotesque events, the inability to find the proper words. He looks for absences, gaps, jumps, structural discontinuities, especially with regard to chronology in place. All these become highly significant for his analysis, but he also adds something else from his dimension of psychology. He looks at the alteration between what he calls distress and relief in the course of her testimony. Distress meaning moments of emotion and being upset as she's telling it, and moments of relief where she uh, 
is able to express some kind of uh, degree of, of um, relief. Boder sees this rhythmic altering as a key part of the emotion of the testimonies. And of course, the fact is that many of these people who were still testifying were still within the event. This becomes the basis of much of his future analytic work. But as if to demonstrate his kind of cross-disciplinary analysis, he also will use a poem. For example, Samuel Coleridge's poem, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, to help illuminate Kovitska's guilt and the feelings that she has over her own survival and the loss of her daughter. This, under, this attempt to understand the, quote, incoherent nature of parts of her narrative and how memories of these grievous events are intertwined with turbulent feelings of guilt um, will play a key part of his analysis. I'm gonna play now the last part of Kovitska's interview, the interview he did with Kovitska. This is in Yiddish, but it's accompanied by an English translation, which I'll have you see. What's, I think, there's many things that are important here, but among those things, one, the trembling of her voice, the idea of being very much still within the event, the reference to uh, her child, and the fact that this interview ends with her statement, um, I am alone. So this will take about uh, maybe a minute or so, and you'll be able to follow on, you'll be able to follow based on the arrow where they are, where we are. Interesting that this was taken in the Wiesbaden synagogue, which was a synagogue that did survive the war, and it was the day, as you saw from the bottom there, before Rosh Hashanah, and this is uh, September of 1946. Never losing sight of the ethical stakes of the interviews. Oops, go back here. Boder speculates at the end of his essay, analyzing this testimony, that the reading and painstaking analysis of these verbatim recorded and verbatim translated reports may give lay people the opportunity for self-projection into the events of history. Self-projection into the events of history, meaning we can empathize. The event interviews could help others, he argues, with empathy with those who suffered, as well as a sense of awareness that may help recognize the, need, the seeds of social ill before they become once again catastrophic. At the end of topical autobiographical, autobiographies, he even calls this impulse the ethical idealism at the heart of his work. This dual attention to scientific analysis, the psychological analysis, and ethical import will consistently motivate his research throughout the post-1948 period as he, his students, and his wife, Dora, begin the arduous process of transcribing, translating, and indexing the testimonies. By the time of his book, I Did Not Interview the Dead, was published, Boder had already developed a set of categories and a preliminary analysis of traumatic, traumatic experiences. He intended to use these to evaluate the impact on personality. He developed a series of indices over the years to come, and these would become, in fact, critical for being to able to work through the, the scale of testimony that he had. I'll show you a couple examples as he, and these indexing systems were really among some of the very first ever developed to understand what was in the testimonies 
This is a subject and situations index with about 300 entries. He also developed a geographic and ethnic index, a trauma inventory, a persons and organizations index, and he was intending to develop an anthropological and psychological index as well. Each entry is keyed to the typewritten and translated interviews, so the numbers there correspond to the typewritten pages of his self-published book, Topical Autobiographies, that contains all of the interviews. I do want to emphasize something about the intellectual achievement of these indices. They were among the first to make sense of the narrative content of Holocaust testimonies at this scale. In the 1950s, professional Holocaust history was in its infancy, and the collection of primary source materials, while starting in earnest right after the war, this is something that Laura Jakush and others have looked at, was still in its very early stages of processing and organization. Boder created a scaffolding of sorts to characterize the content of more than 3,000 pages of testimony keyed to identifying events, places, people, objects, and actions. And the entries also included variations, usages, subcategories, and intertextual references. Anyone in the field of information studies, library sciences, and archiving would certainly know the arduousness and intellectual importance of this task. At the same time, he developed a unique index for classifying different types of trauma and a process for encoding the narratives by traumatic experience. The only research article that he ever published on this work, however, is this one called The Impact of Catastrophe, Assessment and Evaluation from 1954. He articulates a number of goals, and he really didn't have a chance to explore all these goals, but they were, he wanted to do a content analysis attuned to trauma. That was the first thing. Second, he wanted to do a linguistic analysis of the narratives. Third, he wanted to generalize. What would this say about trauma in general? And fourth, he wanted to do comparative work. And interestingly, the comparative work would take him to another disaster, but not a man-made disaster, rather a natural one, and it was sufferers of the 1951 Kansas City flood. It was a natural disaster where people lost their homes and about half a million people were displaced. Obviously a completely different kind of catastrophe, but a chance for him to also go and talk to people who had gone through something. He worked with a team of students and researchers, in fact, when he moved to UCLA in 1952, to develop a system to rate and characterize each trauma by severity and then encode the narratives by frequency in which these traumatic experiences happened. Like the indices, Boder sought to derive the method of analysis from the historically and culturally unprecedented character of the interviews themselves. He came up with 56, or sorry, 46 traumas. I'm not going to read them all, but they are characterized in different groups, geographic traumas, things like movement and displacement, cultural affective traumas like prolonged states of terror, um, the blocking of reading and writing, the prohibition on hope, medical uh, traumas, um, unnecessary operations, labor, forced labor, direct bodily violence, um, transportation, food, and cleanliness and dress. These were the, these were the um, categories that uh, he developed. However, he was aware that encoding the, the interviews based on the traumas that people experienced the narratives themselves were still laden with so much affectivity, so much emotion, disruptions of chronological continuity, often through flashbacks, um, and they would cover, in an hour or two of reporting, five or years more of experiences. So he had this issue already, condensation, displacement, kind of thinking of psychological categories, probably from Freud. This productive tension between data and narrative will continue to inform his work and, you'll see, my own. Boder developed a process to encode these testimonies, and so I kind of saw, show you what he did. He would look at each testimony, so on the top there is the testimony of Jack Matzner. It says in January 1945, the logger was abandoned, we were transported to Schimburg. These are small villages, it goes on about um, Berg and Belsen, the deaths along the way. And the idea was to, to look at each sentence, sentence by sentence, for the trauma that was mentioned and characterize it from the categories, as well as figure out if it was a personal trauma or a milieu trauma. Personal meaning personally experienced, or milieu meaning in the environment in which the person was. He did this for about 10 of the different testimonies and developed a technique to then add 
essentially add up the traumas that people experienced through tables that look like this. Um, these look like spreadsheets today, and we may be thinking this is you know, an abstraction of, of experiences that how could you, you know, rate a trauma by a number, but in many ways, this also allowed him to return to the narratives uh, with a renewed sense of urgency about what they said. So what you're seeing on the left there is he had five friendly Eastern European refugees, again, Mennonites or Christians who fled Soviet territories, and on the right, concentration camp survivors. And all the traumas are on the side there, 1 through 46. Um, in this case, it's page 2, so you see 31 to 46. Um, bodily violence, indiscriminate beating and killing is rated the highest in terms of the severity. And that was not experienced very often by the group on the left, but it was experienced a lot by the group on the right, the concentration camp survivors. And in fact, Kovitska is in the middle there. You can see Miss K.O., and that's the testimony that I played earlier. So this is something that she experienced significantly with a total ranking there of 352. He then published this, which is essentially a visualization of the data. Uh, so it's the same thing that you just saw, all summed up. Kovitska is the third uh, to write there. And this is an attempt to add up the different traumas that people experienced. While Boder concludes this article with the hope that his quantitative methodology for measuring the impact of catastrophe might be applied more generally to assess the psychological toll of any disaster, he considers the project really as exploratory, an experimental reading, he says, in the hopes to supplement it further with more content-based linguistic analysis. Some of the preliminary linguistic analysis was actually being performed by his students, Polly Hammond and Frank Smith, as well as his wife, Dora Boder, and in some of the grants that he wrote in 1952 um, to a number of organizations, including Guggenheim, Ford Foundation, as well as uh, National Institute for Mental Health, they were attempting to begin to analyze the traumas, looking at the rhythm of distress and relief, so emotional elements, looking at the kind of linguistic elements, like adjectives, verbs, adverbs, pronouns used, and what he calls various token type analysis, which is to break the narratives down into individual uh, lexical uh, categories. This is a count that was actually done, as you said at the bottom there, by Miss Boder uh, from the UCLA archives. This is of pronoun usage. It was never published, um, but it was an attempt again to begin to apply the beginnings of a large scale linguistic analysis um, to the testimonies. He spent the final years of his life trying to develop what he called a generalizable model of traumatic experiences, hedonic experiences is the technical term here. Not just in the most extreme cases of concentration camps and death camps, but in all aspects of life, whether trauma experienced by survivors of natural disasters or military service, or in the workforce or military or any dimension. These half bells, as he calls them, was an attempt to assign trauma in order so that we understand not only the narrative dimension of trauma, how it's told, what the impact is in terms of the personality, but also a way to determine the severity, the frequency, and the emotional impact. But interestingly, his material is not just autobiographical reports or recorded narratives or questionnaires, but it also included works of American literature, like F. Scott Fitzgerald, William Faulkner, Ernest Hemingway as if to actually kind of talk about the importance of the narrative aspect, the humanities, the emotions, the experience, the memory, existing side by side with the quantitative analysis from the social sciences. So before I turn to some of my own work in the digital humanities, I think it's worth listening to Boder talk about his method. And I'm going to play this. This has been recently digitized from UCLA's library special collections. It was from a decaying quarter-inch audio reel. I don't think it's probably been heard since 1956, so the sound quality is a little bit poor. But what I think is interesting about it is that he'll talk with great passion about wanting the interviews in terms of the spoken words and the voices. I wanted the interviews. I wanted spoken words. He didn't care if they were chronological or not, because he realized that trauma often is non-chronological. It comes from flashbacks. It comes from memories. It comes, only, you might say even, out of order. It's incoherent. And so for him, that was okay that it wasn't chronological. 
He also sees his work as a kind of messenger, as a kind of playing forward. And finally, if there's a little bit of time, I'll let you hear his traumatic analysis at the end. So this will go for about two minutes, and let's see if we can hear it. It's just audio. I have a story of eight Kimmelman. That's the only incomplete story in my book. It was on the eighth month. I had eight for four and a half hours, and his protocol is 126 typewritten pages, and the story is not finished. You see, I never tried to steer them toward the end, because I was afraid of abridgment. I thought it's irrelevant to me whether I have the end or the middle or what not. I was, I wanted the internet. I wanted spoken material. Oh, uh, my greatest comfort is that Library of Congress has already the duplicates of all my schools. And they get on microcards every story that is being verbatim translated. And other people go in and, and will work on it. I was to some extent only a messenger. So, I was to some extent only a messenger, he says. So I'm now going to turn to the second part of my lecture, fast forward more than a half a century to computational methods in the digital humanities. In many ways, we have plenty of the tools that Boder didn't have. The ability to create and query massive databases, the ability to automatically encode data, tools for text mining and text analysis, data visualization tools, statistical processing, and much more. We can ask some questions. What does it mean that we have these tools? Especially, what does it mean to undertake digital analysis at a massive scale in Holocaust studies? What ethical questions come to the foreground? To consider this challenge, we should just briefly talk about the word digital and just remind ourselves that digital means pertaining to the digits, literally the fingers. It refers to counting and quantification. And by definition, it's always reductive in that sense, as opposed to analog forms, which encode information um, as continuous units Digital is discrete or discontinuous. It uses numerical forms to communicate uh, organ information. But nowadays, you might say, almost everything has become digitized. We have today, for example, um, we have at a scale that we've never seen, really never experienced, we have 50 million records from the International Tracing Service that, refer that reference nearly 17 or more million people Millions of records, documents, and artifacts in the US Holocaust Memorial Museum's digital collections. Four and a half million victim records in Yad Vashem's name database. 55,000 testimonies and millions of tables of metadata from the Shoah Foundation's Visual History Archive. When we type words into an empty, when we type words into an empty search box to find out a way to find out what's in this, these testimonies, we often can retrieve information when we more or less know what we want to find. But I became interested in this project because what happens when we simply don't know what we want to find? Uh, what if we don't know what to put in the search box? How could we begin to browse and find and discover things? So over the past years, my research has focused on the Shoah Foundation's testimonies and database, um, not only to analyze the testimonies using computational methods, but to develop some ideas about how digital information systems can be ethical. This concern about ethics seems especially urgent to me in the wake of the Facebook and Cambridge Analytica scandals, which illustrated the dark side of digital technologies. Data harvesting on an unprecedented scale, inscrutable algorithms, we have no idea how they work. And of course, within Holocaust studies, there's already a question about using computational means, because it's often been greeted with suspicion precisely because we know that technologies of tabulation, computing, counting, and processing we're linked to genocide. The idea of thinking about people as numbers, as Zygmunt Bauman said, was a condition of possibility uh, for genocide. And as Edwin Black has shown in his book on IBM and the Holocaust, computational processing in the form of IBM's punch card system automated the process of identifying Jews from census data, registration forms, and other government records in the 1930s and early 1940s. This is the dark side of course, of computation. But rather than seeing technology as either inherently positive or inherently negative, we have to start, of course, with the human beings who created it. 
and understand their decisions at all levels from data gathering, algorithms, encoding, data structures, interfaces, and everything else. Why is this necessary in Holocaust studies? Well, for one reason, the Holocaust has already been digitized on an unparalleled scale, and perhaps, and this is a, maybe the most important part, is the Holocaust may be able to teach us something about the ethics of the algorithm. That is to say, the Holocaust may have implications, the digitization of the Holocaust may have implications that help us to create a more ethical computing. So, the Shoah Foundation, this is, to date, um, the largest digital archive of Holocaust and genocide testimony in the world, about 55,000 videos. Um, they're broken down by categories, as you can see here. Um, the ones I'll be talking about are primarily Holocaust, but I'll talk a little bit about the Nanjing massacre survivors, survivors of the Tutsi, Tutsi survivors of the Rwandan genocide, and Armenian survivors at the very end. The videos range in length from between one, I mean, from several minutes to 10 hours, but most are between one and three hours in duration. We're talking about 114,000 hours of testimony. It would take you probably 25 years, assuming you watched 12 hours a day, 365 days a year, and understood 41 different languages. So we're talking about scale and scope here. The scope of the digital archive, its sheer scale, when measured in terms of hours of testimony, is not readily comprehensible to the human facilities of listening. And thus, we have databases and computation more broadly to organize, categorize, and search for the content of the testimony. The database that consists of indexing terms that link keywords to segments of video. So altogether, the indexing terms form a thesaurus, about 60,000 words. And there's some transcripts of a few of the testimonies, about 1,000 Holocaust testimonies, the Nanjing testimonies, and some of the Tutsi testimonies exist as transcripts. So briefly, just about the indexing system, because this is something I'll visualize a little bit later. The Shoah Foundation developed a broad set of categories for indexing the testimonies. Like, what are they about? Well, they're about, at this point, someone's talking about daily life, or they're talking about captivity, or they're talking about health, or they're talking about feelings, they're talking about liberation. These are the broadest level of categories that the Shoah Foundation has. And you might think back to Boder. He, again, was also thinking about indexing categories and what people are talking about. The what is important here, because what the Shoah Foundation has created, and I don't want to impugn this at all, I think it's extremely useful, is a controlled vocabulary, meaning it's a set of terms that one can then apply to the, um, to the testimonies in order to understand what they're about. They tend to focus on three types of relationships, what they call inheritance relationships, like camp begging is a camp adaptation method, where camp shoes are part of camp clothing, that's a whole part relationship, or associative relationships, camp corpse cremations are associated with camp corpses. Um, they tend to focus and prioritize nouns, people, places, things, events. Boder did this to a certain extent as well, although he also was interested in psychological um, markup, as we saw. If we visualize some of the top-level categories, we see things like this. This is 200 Holocaust testimonies from top to bottom over time, and they're divided by one-minute segments. The Shoah Foundation indexes by one-minute segments. And so places tend to be mentioned very often in the very beginning of a testimony. Almost always, you start with place. Other categories, like emotion and thoughts, tend to be listed much less so. Discrimination tends to focus in the first third, and still in moving images tends to come in the last part. Part of the reason for this is that the goal of the interview, as defined by the Shoah Foundation, was to produce a story-like narrative that followed the chronology of the survivor's life, beginning with experiences in the pre-war period, before moving to the war and the Holocaust, and lastly, the post-war period, and an interview with family members and a future message. This indexing is extremely important because, to date, it's the only way to search the content of the t t testimonies. While the goal, according to the foundation, is pursued objectivity, it's important to understand that a human listener decided what to index and what not to index. A human listener decided what indexing term to use and what indexing term not to use. And a human listener decided if a given narrative segment could even be indexed at all. So on the front end, we would have Daniel Gaslowitz. And on the back end, you would have the data about him. 
These are narratives, they're tables of data, so the computer can make sense of them. It um, is organized by keywords and labels that refer to what he's talking about in each one minute segment of his testimony. Again, this is extremely useful when I want to search on something that I know. It's not useful when I don't know what I want to look for. Certain things then go missing, like latent content, tone, rhythm, figural language, expressiveness of the face, the very acts of telling that mark the contingency of all communication. And it's here, really, that my research begins. I hope my voice holds out so I have a bit of a post-nasal drip here. I'm interested in testimony that is not describable by keywords. I'm interested in the sounds of the voice, its loudness, its cadence, its pitch, the expressive gestures, the discontinuities, the interruptions, the flashbacks, the emotive or the traumatic qualities of the narrative, the rhythm of speech, the code switching between languages, the stuttering, the silences, the gaps. How do we find these and appreciate them? So together with my UCLA team, we started by measuring variations in the audio track of each testimony. We did this by sampling the audio stream every 250 milliseconds, attuned to changes in decibel level and pitch. We aggregated those results into spreadsheets and produced visualizations such as these to determine statistically significant variations in voice over the course of the testimony. I term this process acoustic indexing. There are a couple noteworthy things here. One, those lines you see every 30 minutes or so represent tape changes. You might know that the Shoah Foundation used 30-minute Betacam tapes when they recorded, and so they switched the tapes every 30 minutes. And so those are not real variations other than their actual tape switching. But the other thing that's important here is that we also aggregate these results over one minute, and then I looked at the result to figure out fluctuations in voice, pitch, and cadence. So this is Erica Jacoby, and I was very curious what's going on around minute 42 or 43 in her testimony. I know objectively what's being described based on the database. Objectively, she's talking about Auschwitz-Birkenau, deportation, camp selection, Poland, 1944, loved one separations, grandparents. The indexing terms at the top, time and place, movement, mistreatment, death, all these things are indexed for me, and yet they tell me nothing about the delivery of the testimony. And so this becomes now a way to search within the testimony, and I realize the decision that she's talking about here is actually the very one that saved her life and that of her mother. I'm gonna play minute 42 for you. We, we were told to line up one after the other, and shoved into a, a line, and um, I held on to my mother. But then my cousin, my aunt, asked her to hold a baby, and so my mother held the baby, and I left my mother, and I went with the other younger people. And uh, I passed by this very attractive man, this officer, who told me, go ahead, in German, and I, passed by and I was taken to the place where the working people were taken. I was halfway there when suddenly I see my mother behind me. And I looked back and I saw my grandparents. And I saw my grandparents talking and yelling to my mother. And I waved to, to them and I said, I see you tonight. My mother ran after me. She said, she went in front of Mangala and said to him, I can work, I'm strong. So she caught up with me and I said, what happened? She said, my grandmother told her not to leave me alone because there were so many German soldiers around and it wasn't safe. So uh, my, my mother gave the baby back to the mother and thus, she saved her life, which she really didn't know at that time. So in addition to <clears throat> acoustic variation, 
We also measure word count, word count by minute to analyze changes in verbal cadence and narrative rhythm. Correlating word count and decibel level sometimes reveals significant changes in narrative structure, such as flashbacks and memories that disrupt a strict chronology. In this example from Moshe Tal, the decibel high point, which you can see on the top, and the low point in terms of word count on the bottom, um, point to a particularly uplifting flashback in his testimony. Tal was, who became a cantor, actually survived the Holocaust with his father working at a factory affiliated with Oskar Schindler. Both were placed on Schindler's list. And so I was immediately drawn to this section of the testimony, which I'll play for you now. My mother and my father, they're all, they were all uh, fond of music, of songs, of, uh, my goodness, of uh, opera. My mother and my father were, were just opera, great opera buffs. And the house reverberated sounds of opera all the time. But besides opera, we had so folk songs. Comes to my mind a, a little folk song that I I learned as a little as a as a little boy of six or seven. Im einanili mili. This is the famous pronouncement of of Hillel Hazakin, the Hillel the elderly in Pirkei Avot, in the uh, Ethics of the Father. It was a set to a song. This im ein anili mili, uchshani la atzmi maani, ve im lo achshaf ein matai. This is famous pronounces. If I am not for myself, who is for me? But if I am for myself, who am I? And if not now, when? So the song went like this. Im ein anili mili, uchshani la atzmi maani, ve im lo achshaf ein matai, ein matai, ve im this was a song that was sung very popularly in, 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 in Krakow. In Krakow. And this came to my mind. As a little child, I, I, I learned this little song, which has so much meaning. It has so much meaning, such deep meaning. So again, the idea here is looking at not just the what, but also the how, the how of the delivery. We can also look at correlating word count and decimal pitch to look at the overall consistency and variation in testimonies. Um, these are scatter plots that attempt to map decimal changes and uh, word count. The computer can't tell us what this means, um, only that they can tell if there are variations within a testimony. If I compare um, Moshe Taub's on the left, which is pretty much, you would say, consistently delivered in terms of word count and uh, decimal, with that one exception, to someone like Ephraim Hoffman, whose testimony is extremely emotional, you can see that there's significant differences in the delivery, and yet, from the level of the keywords, I would know nothing about this. I'd have no way of, of learning that or, or finding it. And when we look at the scatter plot as well from decibel levels and word count, you see significant variation, which again impacts the way in which the story is told. And I want to recover that aspect because the how is just as much important as what they are saying. In addition to looking at variation within a given testimony, I've also been interested in variation and continuity across the corpus of Holocaust testimonies, as well as comparative questions between testimonies given by different victim groups, particularly Tutsi and Nanjing survivor testimonies. These were also collected and produced by the Shoah Foundation in the last decade. Corpus analysis, that is the entire corpus, can reveal patterns, structures, associations, experiences that otherwise may not be considered together. In this sense, computational analysis provides a kind of distant listening, which is different, of course, than how humans listen, because it's based on a large selection of the corpus or even the whole of the database. So this is a visualization of 10,000 keywords and 100 testimonies. And it connects survivors by keyword in common. So if you have the same keyword in common, you get a line. Whereas earlier, we were looking at narrative form, that is the likelihood that a given indexing caret category would be mentioned at a particular percentage point, these visualizations are looking at narrative content, that is what's being said that they have in common, 
The large circles are nodes, uh, survivors, and the lines that connect them are keywords used in the testimony. The thicker the line, the higher the frequency of use. So keywords that are used more frequently are in the middle, whereas ones on the outside are more infrequently used. And that also moves the survivor to the outside as well. So they have less common experiences. I was really interested by the right-hand side. Um, I wanted to know who already Leopold Haas was and why he had so few connections with other survivors. And perhaps part of the reason is because some of the experiences he describes, like a, an Italian Jew being hidden who converted to Christianity, who attended church, uh, were simply experiences that are significantly less commonly used. He also is connected to Armando Moreno, who was uh, a, a survivor who was not Italian, but based on a couple of keywords that they had in common. Somewhat different experience, um, but again, it allows us to understand what we might say are outlier experiences, or experiences that are perhaps non-canonical, or perhaps even allows us to assess certain assumptions that we have about what testimony is or what survivorship meant. And so this allows us to create more differentiated perspectives on the range of testimony. I think the stakes are actually even higher than that because whole corpus analysis potentially is a kind of democratization of knowledge. So instead of only human listening, we potentially can listen to them all. A computer can easily listen to thousands if not millions of works, essentially every survivor who had his or her story recorded. Now, I'm not arguing that computers should replace human listening, not at all. But I am saying that computational or algorithmic analysis can be ethical precisely because it takes into, the, into account the fullness of the database insofar as all the data related to the narrative of every survivor becomes part of the analysis. Now, as I suggested earlier, this presupposes something. It presupposes that the data, the database has more than just objectively mentioned keywords or indexing terms. We also have to find ways to hear the diversity of voices, of silence, of singing, of gestures, and so much more. Keywords here are just a start. I'm going to move to a conclusion and zoom out once again here by looking at the 26 top level indexing categories among, oops, that's already Leopold Haas. <laughs> so I'm going to move to this uh, slide, which is 40,563 Holocaust testimonies uh, by time. And so it basically is saying, what are they talking about at a given percentage period of time? So in the first 0, 1%, most, about 80%, are talking about time and place. You know, where were you born? Where did you grow up? Over time, other categories enter in, like captivity, um, discrimination, discrimination responses, liberation is in red on the right-hand side. That makes sense, you know, in terms of the narrative structure. Um, movement includes deportation and force movement. Um, you also have forced labor and other categories that enter in as well in the middle. Those decrease uh, towards the end of the testimony where feelings and thoughts come up, and then finally still in moving images. Many of these terms, by the way, co-occur at the same time, so they don't necessarily mean that, that mistreatment and death is only talked about 5% of the time. It can be talked about in 90% um, you know, of the testimonies, but it may occur at different, slightly different times, and it can co-occur with other, other categories. It does, though, give it a relative weight as to like when and what is spoken about. And I thought it would be interesting to compare these to other uh, victim groups that were created by the Shoah Foundation, uh, that were, that were, that is to say, testimonies that were created by the Shoah Foundation. And so this is a visualization of 57 Tutsi testimonies. And the lack of smoothness here is only attributable to the fact that the sample size is a lot smaller. So instead of 40,000, we have 57. So the lack of smoothness is based on that. The general outlines are similar. Um, that is to say, you have a sense of time and place increasing and decreasing. Still and moving images are talked about actually a lot less. Um, they tend not to show photos and have uh, family uh, at the end. Mistreatment and death is a somewhat larger category uh, throughout, and it comes earlier uh, in this. Um, Feelings and thoughts are perhaps the largest category at the end, and this is actually because most people were talking about reconciliation and the fact that they're continuing to live in the land of the perpetrators. And so this question of having to live, these are expressions of feelings, and also bringing perpetrators to justice becomes a very big part of Rwandan testimonies. This is uh, the Nanjing massacre testimonies. Um, again, a smaller sample size, probably similar in some ways uh, with regard to some of the major categories. 
also very little with still and moving images. But I want to ask some questions here. From one point, this allows us to ask questions about the structural similarities or dissimilarities of testimony. We can talk about convergent or divergent developments of the genre of testimony, how testimonies are being created, what kind of questions are being asked, how are they structured, and also how do they enter into a database. All these things are happening, so to speak, under the hood, and I feel like we have to ask these questions because they tell us so much about the very genre of testimony. As a point of contrast, let me show you this. These are the Armenian genocide testimonies, which actually look quite different. And part of the reason they look different is they were not produced by the Shoah Foundation, but rather by the Armenian Film Foundation in the 1970s and 80s. The testimonies are generally a lot shorter. They're generally not chronological life stories. As a genre, they're much more experimental. They use multiple camera angles, multiple locations. They have many outtakes and a wide variety of experiences from survivors among artwork in a home studio to family dinners, literary readings, performance pieces, and more conventional testimonial narratives. These are just some screenshots from those. The Shoah Foundation decided in their database to mark up the camera. And the reason they had to mark up the camera is because the Film Foundation used techniques like zooming and panning and lighting and dissolving and cutting in order to produce these testimonies in the 1970s, 80s, and early 90s. The Shoah Foundation, however, did not mark up the camera because they wanted to achieve a consistent look to all the interviews, and in fact forbid the camera to move except for the very end. They believed that any movement of the camera would add editorial content and compromise the testimony's historical validity. This is really interesting to me, again, when I think about the way in which testimony as a genre evolves or changes. So with regard to these high-level data visualizations, we can ask questions about testimony. And of course, all this is only as good as the data in the database, right? As soon as we should always take this with a grain of salt. But perhaps more than detecting underlying truths, these kind of visualizations help us ask better questions about the changing nature of testimony and technology, the significance of a generalizable digital framework for marking up and archiving genocide testimony, and even the question of whether the Visual History Archive and other archives can offer paradigms for archiving and producing testimony. These are interesting questions, and they're by no means easy to answer. So last little bit, and my, my conclusion is now. Very much following in the tradition of Boder, my own analysis, oh, thank you, my own analysis is to use quantitative and qualitative means in order to find new things, unleash new possibilities of meaning and interpretation. I don't see technology or digitization or computation as a limit or a challenge to Holocaust studies, but rather an opportunity to develop a humanistic, ethical approach to computation. If we consider the database as a refuge that is always open and growing, as holding something, as preserving it, um, then we have to be open to the diversity of individual experiences and the ways in which data can give rise to new narratives and new interpretations. We now have the opportunity to build, explore, compare digital archives in ways that constantly reinterpret and reinscribe the survivor stories. And we'll never be done listening, watching, or analyzing the testimonies because there's always more. There's a surplus of meaning that's never finally captured, tagged, or marked up. This to me is what an ethical digital information system would facilitate an ongoing process of writing, rewriting, interpreting and reinterpreting, listening and re-listening, through ever thicker relations between data and narrative, between saying and unsaying, indexing and visualizing, it's possible for computation to facilitate an ethics of listening that helps us hear, find, and appreciate new things. We can do this by moving between the whole of the database and the individual testimonies, transforming both in a never-ending process that gives rise to new narratives. In this sense, the ethics of the algorithm can really be defined as computation that humanizes. It returns humanity to those who are dehumanized. That is the ethics of the algorithm, and we might begin with both close and distant listening. That is, listening to the individual testimonies one by one, and listening to all 54,000 at once. Thank you. thought-provoking lecture. We have a few minutes for uh, questions. There are microphones on both sides of the auditorium. I'll ask you to introduce yourself and to keep your questions brief. 
Thanks. Please. Uh, good evening. My name is Mike. I'm just curious. This information is it? Was it available for the uh, for the Nuremberg trials as evidence? And if not, then can or has it been used? for any future type of genocide acts? Right. No, for those trials, in fact, there, this material wouldn't have been available. So the voters happened in 46, and they weren't transcribed and made available for years later. The Shoah Foundation only began recording in the 1990s. Um, now, there were other types of historical documentation available, certainly. Historical commissions were deployed throughout uh, Germany and other, other countries immediately after the war, mainly with questionnaires. And uh, those questionnaires were like interviews in some ways, but they weren't uh, spoken documents. And so you really don't have what's called the era of the witness until the 1960s. It really starts um, with the Eichmann trial. And that's really where you have witnesses coming forward to speak about in, in public uh, about their experiences. And in fact, you know, more than 100. Did this validate their testimony? Does it do what? Did this help validate the, the truth in their testimony? as far as comparing uh, many uh, um, survivors that would you know, talk about it, whether, whether, whether they would all have similarities mm. in the characteristic testimonies that you've acknowledged here. Right, that's an interesting question, if it helps to validate. You know, when I read the Rwandan ones uh, in particular, that, and this is something we started to do some analysis on, is like, is the content different from someone who is telling a story that's more like a chronology of their life? The Rwandan ones tend to be, and this perhaps is motivated by the interviewers as well, about finding the perpetrators. And oftentimes it's exactly for that purpose, which is jurid juridical um, for truth and reconciliation commissions, um, for bringing justice, and also bringing closure to events. And the, one of the most common questions in the Rwandan testimonies is, who did that? Who did it to you? naming the perpetrator. Um, we have that sometimes in Holocaust testimonies in the 1990s, but in many ways, they have a, they're a different genre uh, because they're, at least for the Watshoa Foundation ones, they're a different genre. The Boder ones are also very different because they're in the event. These are people in displaced person camps. They're refugees at this point. And although there was an imp impulse, of course, through Nuremberg and other places to try the perpetrators, and this was happening simultaneous, simultaneously, I don't know of any of the voter testimonies being used directly uh, to persecute um, perpetrators. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm David Benowitz. I was wondering, in your aggregation plots, mm -hmm. you had a category called politics, which didn't seem to appear anywhere in any of the plots. And I'm wondering if that was because of the way it was coded the questions that were asked, or if the issue of yeah. politics just was not relevant? It's a really interesting question, yeah. You know, one of the things that I find so interesting about these categories is what's included under them and what's not. And this is, you know, for me, movement seems to be a very, like, movement. Does that mean free movement or involuntary movement? Does it mean deportation or does it mean, you know, I'm visiting my neighbor's house? And it, and it can mean potentially a lot of different things. Daily life can also mean a lot of different things. Does it mean daily life before the war? Or does it mean daily life in a ghetto? Very different thing. And the same thing for politics. So one of the, there's, there's a politics, so to speak, of a thesaurus. And I want people to, to recognize that an indexing system is itself not objective. It, it makes decisions. And those decisions have huge consequences for how things are categorized. And then if we're searching on them, if we can't find something, we're like, why is this the case? Well, because it's been categorized in a certain way. And so exposing, and I mean exposing this in a productive way, just telling what the decisions are so that we know what kind of decisions were being made for how the information is marked up is a critical thing. It's not a neutral process. Um, so politics is a good example of that, but I've found this to be the case constantly. When I go, when I travel up and down the index looking for terms, some are very obvious, and some um, I wonder why they're in the term, I mean, they're in the categories that they are. So, thank you for that question. Um, hi, I'm Susan Garfinkel, and um, I work at the Library of Congress, so I want to be in touch with you afterwards about, he said something about how pleased he was that some of his uh, documents were at the library, so I want to mm -hmm. get that, re that reference from you later. But my question is also about Boder. Um, 
Are you, have you heard of something called the Outline of Cultural Materials? Yeah. A outline of Cultural Materials, um, Murdoch out of Yale. So in the 1930s, I'm aware of another person who was working on indexing, mm. in this case it was anthropology, mm -hmm. um, and it became a project called the Human Relations Area Files, which is still run at Yale now. So I, I didn't know about voters' intense use of indexing, which I mm -hmm. really want to explore now that you've, you've talked about it, but mm -hmm. do you have any sense of what motivated him to get into that level of intensive indexing? Um, obviously, he was, he was very moved by the, the testimony that he went to gather, but the decision to try and index it in this way strikes me mm -hmm. as perhaps uh, an artifact of the time. I don't know. I wondered what you know about that. It may be an artifact of the time, but I think looking at his writings and, uh, and particularly his grants that he wrote in this period and the reports and some of the material that he did publish, it was really a question of scale. And it was also trying to do content analysis when well, when you have an event that people don't fully understand yet. And I think that was one of the challenges that he had. He felt like he was writing history at the same time that he was indexing primary material. There was, we didn't have the Raul Hilber or Saul Friedlander or, or synthetic overviews of the Holocaust. He struggled. There's terms that he uses that are almost strange. You can see one up there. Dead handlers is now we call them. You know, Zondo Commando. You have dungeons as a category. Um, it's not, it doesn't come up often. I actually looked up what that was, and it seemed like they were victims who were put in cellars. Um, but you have an attempt you know, to develop a screaming as indexed, uh, which is also really interesting as well, like looking at, um, you know, again, the emotive qualities. I think that what he was doing was trying to come up with an intellectual scaffolding to make sense of an event that was so large and needed you know, needed tools from different areas, you know, language, linguistics, psychology, information studies. He put all the testimonies, so the Library of Congress actually has the, the microcards, the microfiches, and the original wire spools. And I, so I, they were all deposited there, and he sent them to libraries across uh, the Anglophone world. And part of this was, like he said in the end, I'm a messenger. I want to put this material out there for posterity. I know other people will work on it. I've done what I can. Um, so, thank you for your question. Thanks very much, uh, Alex Brill. Um, the slides that you presented at the end tended to comp uh, compare across genocides, intergenocide mm -hmm. comparisons, um, but of course there are lots of differences like yeah. language and the characteristics mm -hmm. of the victims and things like that. I'm wondering what patterns um, are observable intragenocide within a, or within a data set if they're sorted by gender or by age, to what degree does that cause those mm. graphs to, to evolve in different ways? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Um, and it's sort of one of the, that's you know, at the heart of some of the research that we're doing right now. Um, this is, it would be hard to answer it you know, in, a, in a succinct way, but there's issues, uh, you can break, look at gender, language, um, time the testimony was taken, geographic location of where the testimony was taken, um, distance in terms of both time and space to the events, um, language, questions the interviewer asked, um, the training the, interviewee, the interviewer had, uh, which varied tremendously as well. Um, some interviews had more training than others. Different kind of questions were being asked. Um, the Shoah Foundation has, over time, uh, developed a set of tools uh, for all aspects of the testimonies, from the videographer, to the sound, to the kind of questions, to the arc of the testimony, when to follow up, when not to follow up on certain things. And so a lot of these questions can now be asked. I would hesitate to you know, break it down in any kind of way, you know, right you know, off, the, off the cuff. But, in, but you're exactly right that one can do both comparative work across genocide, but also within uh, genocide. I'm really interested in the Boder material. I'm interested because the Boder material is so close to the events themselves and because he oversaw all the translations that, that, were, that are there. So I mentioned these are nine different languages and often there's code switching happening even within. If they're talking in German, they also talk in Yiddish often. Uh, and he'll might, he might begin in English and then he'll switch to another language. And so there's that aspect which I think is also interesting. Um, but because these interviews um, were done so early and were done in, in DP camps, 
um, often under very difficult situations. Um, you know, there might be planes flying overhead and there's background noise and he doesn't have a, a, you know, a studio to produce these works. Um, the material that he has really allows for, I think, substantial difference uh, with testimonies that were produced uh, you know, many years later. Um, again, it's not as if they neither disqualifies anything about them, they're simply different perspectives. And one of the interesting things that, to note is that Boder's interviewees were often re-interviewed years later. And one of the things that happened, one of the things that, uh, and there's been a number of very interesting studies, um, in fact, uh, you know, Kira and among others have worked on this, is that these early Holocaust testimonies, later people gave their stories to the Shoah Foundation or the Yale Fortune of Archive and other archives, including the Holocaust Museum here. And there's, um, there are some differences in the way people tell their stories. And part of that has to do with developing a language to describe these events, right? A language that comes from historical studies, sometimes from film, from popular media, but also the professionalization of Holocaust studies. Um, and so developing a language to describe these events is something that happened over time. And what's really interesting about the Boder testimonies is that language hadn't been fully developed. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm looking at right now. May I ask a question? My name is Christoph Diekmann. I've worked a lot on, on Lithuania, on the Shoah in Lithuania. Um, I, I haven't really understood your point about uh, it's possible to listen to fifth, over 50,000 uh, testimonies at once. You said something like that. Yeah. Now, in, in the talk, you are, in, in the discussion, you are very differentiated about the time, about who is talking. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't that all get lost if you talk about, if you listen no, to 50,000 at once? Like, if, yeah. if I listen, if I read or listen to, to 20 testimonies, five from mm. New York, five from Berlin, five mm. from Vilna, five from Kiev, mm -hmm. I get a whole range right. of different stories, and they Absolutely. talk differently. Absolutely. And doesn't that all get lost if I listen to all of them at once? So yeah. how, how do you deal with this? Yeah, I was saying that people can't do that. Um, but again, a computational analysis with some, it allows something which I was calling whole corpus analysis, meaning one can analyze changes in the entire corpus of testimonies that people couldn't possibly hear because exactly that reason. You, we can keep 20 in our minds, 30, 40, 50, 100. Um, of the ones I've listened to very closely, perhaps you know, I have 100 that I can call up those experiences and I can use in my teaching and among you know, several that I know survivors personally, but you're exactly right. Even when I compare across location, there's only so much that I can keep in my mind. And so the argument that I'm saying here is that if we use computational tools, we might be able to either see patterns or detect correlations or relationships that we wouldn't be able to listen to ourselves. We wouldn't be able to see them. Like I wouldn't have found Arnie Leopold Haas, for example. I wouldn't even have thought to search on you know, church attendance uh, as, a, as a category. And even if I did, how was I to know where his testimony fits in relationship to others? Is this a common experience, not a common experience? Whose experiences are also overlapping? Why are they overlapping? And so what becomes possible is pattern detection um, and correlations. So that's the only thing that when you when I talk about listening to them as well, all at once, it's in order to see patterns and that wouldn't be visible to the human eye or the human ear. Hello, my, my name is Walter, and uh, this, this body of knowledge, which we now call data, has been analyzed a number of different ways, as, as described in your talk. Mm -hmm. uh, the first questioner, I think his name was Mike, led me to think about uh, what you just mentioned, correlation between testimony, between uh, interviews. And, and I was wondering if, the, if, the, if there was a high correlation between uh, the uh, the, the people who were being interviewed, could that, could, could that uh, be used to counter things like, like Holocaust denial? I don't think Dr. Boder had mm -hmm. to deal with that in the, in the 50s and 60s, but we have to today. Yeah. You know, corroboration is a key aspect, I think, of this analytic work. And uh, I think you're exactly right um, that when you have multiple eyewitnesses who may not have known each other talking about the same event in perhaps the same ways, you have opportunities for historical corro corroboration. So I think that's one of the ways that this work could be used, absolutely. And you can do that at a scale, again, that's not just one or two, but potentially thousands of people 
corroborating by the way in which they narrate an event from, again, experiences where they may not have known each other in the event, but they narrate it in the same way. And at the level of language use, at the level of the sentence structure, at the level of you know, testifying. And so this is a use of testimony for juridical means uh, that one can think about corroboration um, precisely in a court of law in, in, a, in a very different way. This will be our last question. Hi, I'm Leslie, and I'm from Ohio State University. I'm here, I'm a professor there. I was just, um, as I was listening to you, I've, I've directed a lot of plays about the Holocaust. I've read many works with my students about the Holocaust. And the one thing I think of is, I, what, what I think we're trying to do here, as a writer myself, is I think we're, we're trying to make, um, we're trying to make a, a quantitative uh, analysis of madness. Hmm. And we're trying to put into common terminology what people can't understand or wrap their minds around, which all has to do with our lack of empathy in our culture. And I'm, I'm glad you can try to help other people to see that in a different way, because I think some people don't go to shows or don't read the literature, and maybe they need more of a quantitative um, analysis, hmm. because I think a lot of people just miss are missing the boat here. And, and I admire your work, and, and I just wanted to say that. Thank you. I think that you know, one of the things that Boder did and what I was trying to do as well is have quantitative and qualitative analysis existing side by side. I think a lot of the analytical work that Boder did has been perhaps not as well known or appreciated, and because it was so early, because it was, you know, it was, it was computational in, in some ways, um, and it was also breaking it down into um, indices. Um, this is an opportunity, I think, as we look at the digital shift that we're all in, it's an opportunity to continue to say that ethical questions are absolutely at the core, whether we're talking about quantification or qual you know, quantification or qualitative analysis. You can't let go of those questions. And so that, for me, why voice and why performance and why gesture and silences and stuttering, all those things that often get left out of information systems are really key. And perhaps we can, we can actually relocate them, surprisingly enough, through computational means. I think we have one last question. <laughs> this time I mean it. <laughs> Sorry. We have a reception, I hear. Exactly. Okay. Name's Mac. I was just wondering, is anybody in academia looking at using any of the new artificial intelligence technologies to look at the metadata? I hear there's someone here doing that. Uh, is that <laughs> <laughs> I would, not that I, I'm not familiar with using um, AI at this point, um, but I imagine this is, this is probably coming. And again, you know, we're talking about millions and millions of records. Uh, so, you know, the opportunity exists, to be sure. Um, again, I wouldn't want to, like, leave the ethical questions out. Uh, please join me in thanking Dr. Fresner for his talk.